Well, welcome to our journey through the gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 11 here in just a moment if you want to be turning there. And I'm going to be walking through uh, the chapter 11 with you. So you want to be turning there. It'll also be on the screens here in just a moment. Uh, on your way there, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever had an experience where you said to yourself, this is not what I expected? Probably all of us have, right? You know, like the Bengals in the Super Bowl. Are you serious? I mean, nobody had that in their expectations this past August. Or maybe you said something like that your first few months into college or your first few months after college working full time for the first time in your life since you were five, not having to go to school, and all of a sudden you're like, this is not quite what I expected. Or maybe you said it a few days into getting a, few, a new puppy or a few nights into getting a new puppy. Maybe you said it a few months into marriage or a few years into kids. This is not what I expected. Or how many of you have ever gotten a gift that you didn't expect? I mean, it was so much what you didn't expect, you're not even sure it's a gift. Just, just suppose, just suppose for a second, I were to buy one of you a gift, it'd be a book. You opened up the package to see the title of the book that I was giving you, and the title reads, Fitness for Dummies. <laughs> now, I bought you this book. It's my gift to you. But that gift could be taken in any number of ways. You could take it as though I'm saying you're out of shape. You could take it as though I'm saying you're dumb. You could take it as though I'm saying you're out of shape, dumb, and I happen to think those are both working in your life. When you think about it, fitness for dummies is a really dumb gift to give somebody else because the gift has the opportunity to offend any number of ways. In fact, it's fitness for dummies is much easier to buy for yourself than it is to give to somebody else. Can I get an amen to that? You say, where are you going with this? I'm going here. What if I were to tell you that the greatest gift of all, Jesus, can actually seem offensive in any number of ways? It can happen when you follow Jesus. Picking up in Matthew chapter 11, 1 through 6. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. The John mentioned here is the John you know is John the Baptist. You spent some time with me earlier in this series getting to know him if you were here with me in the early part of January in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, John the Baptist or JB is the one who paved the way for Jesus in the early part of his ministry in the gospel of Matthew. He preached boldly about the coming of the Messiah. But when Jesus comes on the scene, uh, John recedes. He fades into the background. You don't hear much from John again, because the one greater has come. But just because he fades to the background doesn't mean that he faded in his faithfulness to call people to live in light of the kingdom of God. Because John the Baptist gets in some trouble after he fades into the background. Now, it was Oscar Wilde who said that if you're going to tell people the truth, you better make them laugh or they'll kill you. This is why good comedians may be some of the most effective truth-tellers in the world. There's something about making people laugh so they won't kill you. The problem is John the Baptist didn't live in the same time as Oscar Wilde to get Oscar's advice. 
John pulled no punches. He packed no humor. He preached boldly. And he finally stepped on a political landmine when he began to call King Herod out for having an affair with his brother's wife and eventually taking her to be his own wife. And John the Baptist called him out, and that's how he ends up in prison. He's being held in a prison more than 100 miles away from where Jesus is. The fortress of Macarius is where he's being held. He's got a lot of time to think on his hands. But John still has followers that come and check on him. And so they come and they visit him, John's disciples. And one time John says to them, hey, will you do something for me? Will you, will you go find Jesus, which is no small task. Jesus is 100 miles away. Will you go find Jesus and will you ask him, hey, are you the one to come? <laughs> or should we expect someone else? And you're reading this and you're like, huh? John already knew that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. He was the first person that was telling everyone else, hey, that man of Nazareth is the Messiah. What's going on here? I think John was having what you would call a crisis of faith. Because things have been going not as he expected. For one, Jesus is doing the kind of things uh, that John didn't preach about the Messiah doing. In fact, Jesus isn't doing anything yet that John the Baptist said the Messiah was going to do. If you remember John's sermons in the Gospels, they were all about the Messiah is going to come and he's going to bring fire and judgment. The Messiah is going to come and he's going to baptize you all with your spirit. Neither of those things is happening. Instead of fire and judgment, Jesus is showing up and he's talking about mercy all the time. He's telling religious leaders to go and learn about mercy. Not only that, but Jesus is being seen at a lot of dinner tables, Matthew chapter 9, eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is at parties. He's not walking around with a flamethrower of judgment like John advertised. And he's not pouring out the Spirit on anybody. In the meantime, the majority of John's ministry has primarily been out in the wilderness. He's dressed like an Ewok a Star Wars character loaded in animal fur and skins everywhere. He's eating like he's on a reality TV show, bugs and honey, living life in the wilderness. And now Jesus, while he's in prison, Jesus is hanging out at parties with tax collectors and sinners. What's going on? This isn't what he expected of the Messiah. Maybe even he was hoping that Jesus would have come to his rescue by now. Because he was the forerunner. Not the Toyota, but the original forerunner. The one who paves the way. He was the forerunner. And now he's in prison after standing up for what's right. And Jesus is a hundred miles away. Maybe in more ways than one. And so John sends his disciples, ask him this question. Are you the one to come? And they finally find Jesus after traveling a hundred miles and they ask him the question, and then Jesus says, go back and report to John what you see and hear. I can't imagine hearing this. You've traveled 100 miles. Jesus gives you four sentences. Go back and report to John what you see here and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus is saying a lot here. Uh, Jesus is reminding John that his ministry is unfolding the way prophet Isaiah prophesied it would. Jesus is pulling a page out of John the Baptist's own book. He's reading him his Bible, the Old Testament, because John may have become disconnected in some ways. Perhaps he had been so, fo so focused on one particular aspect of the Messiah that the Messiah is going to bring judgment at some point he lost touch with all the other things the Messiah was going to do. And so Jesus basically quotes the prophet Isaiah about the lame walking, people receiving sight, those who are having leprosy being cleansed, the deaf hearing, the dead are raised. He basically quotes scripture to him. He's just reminding John the Baptist of some of the other things the Messiah was called to do and to provide them with ample evidence of it being done. And then he says this, verse 6. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. That phrase stumble uh, in the original language is the word from which you get the term scandal, scandalon. It, it means to cause somebody to stumble, to trip, 
to be offended or to be, like I've taught you before, off-ended. Literally, when you're offended, somebody is off-ended. They're knocked off balance by something. The verse could be translated, blessed is the man who is not offended on account of me. Now, the fact that Jesus brings this up tells you it's possible then for you to trip over Jesus. It's possible for you to be off-ended by Jesus. It's possible to be thrown off balance. When does this happen? When he says things and does things that you don't expect him to say or do, or when he doesn't do things that you want him to do, that you pray for him to do. At some point, Jesus is going to be offensive to everyone about something. Either it's going to be something he says in his teachings or something he doesn't say that you wish he would. It may be something that he doesn't do that you wish he would. But Jesus is going to be offensive to everyone about something. I mean, you just already read Matthew and you can see this. Earlier in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus says it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And he came not to call righteous, but sinners. That means he thinks you're sick and that you're a sinner. He's calling you sick. (laughs) And he's calling you a sinner. He's calling me sick. And he's calling me a sinner. That can be offensive if you think about it. He also thinks that we can't save ourselves. He thinks that without him, we're like sheep without a shepherd. That's not a compliment. Nobody has a guard sheep. Because sheep are dumb animals without a shepherd. Those are just a few of the things he says. How about some of his parables? Oh, these things can really throw you off. Like the one about the vineyard workers later in Matthew chapter 20. You got some workers that show up at 8 a.m. and then other workers that show up at 4 p.m. They work one hour. The ones that show up at 4 p.m. get paid the same amount of money as the ones who showed up at 8 a.m. I read that parable. That troubles me. We've all worked with people who showed up and worked one hour and they got the credit we did for a whole day. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff that'll just off end you, that you can trip over. Then there's the whole thing of salvation and the forgiveness of sins uh, being tied to him dying on the cross. Maybe if you grew up in church, you've never run into this. I promise you, you live long enough, you're gonna run into this. Once you get out there and you start being challenged in the world with currents of thinking, there's a lot of cynics that just think that's absurd. A father having his son die on the cross for things that other people did. God's a child abuser, I've heard it said. What's happening? They're offended. They may not fully embrace the story that you and I know, but they're momentarily offended. The apostle Paul talked about what an offense the story of the cross is to some in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And beyond all the stuff that Jesus says and does in the Gospels that can throw you off, there are other things that people stumble over or even offended by when it comes to Jesus. It's not hard to find somebody today in your life who can look at something in their personal life or the world and say, if I were God or Jesus, I would have done this or I would have never allowed this. So how can I possibly believe in God They're offended. What's particularly challenging these days is that you and I live in a culture that runs on the adrenaline of offense. We live in a culture that lives to be offended. You know people that look to be offended? Oh, man, it it can make a preacher jumpy these days. I mean, every week, you know, you're learning a new politically correct term. We live in a culture that's ripe with a spirit of offense. Now, please hear me. In Jude, the shortest, uh, well, Jude verse 22, 
You may say, what's the chapter? That's it, Jude 22. You'll have to look at it sometime. You, you, you find this simple verse, be merciful to those who doubt. I do think there are times when we have real doubts that need to be faced and worked through, and you have to give people the time and the space to, to work through their doubts. That's not what I'm talking about here. I've done a series on doubt in the past. The issue is, at some point, all of us, we'll have to realize that we're gonna run into a moment where we are offended by Jesus, where we're gonna stumble over something he says. We're just gonna have trouble swallowing it. And here's the deal. If you live your whole life and you're never offended or troubled or upset or challenged by what Jesus says, then you may not be as familiar with everything he said or did as you think. Or you may have just remade him into the image of you where he just always thinks like you and has the same values like you and always operates like you. It's by digging into the places where he offends you. It's by feeling the offense that you begin to ask the question, why do I feel this way? Why do I feel this way? And sometimes it takes a while to get to it, but don't dismiss it. Don't see it as a reason not to follow him, but instead ask, what is happening? Why do I feel this way? And you often find the particular area that you need to be worked on by him. Often the most transforming moments of your relationship with Jesus are in the areas where you feel initially offended by what he says. You're asking, what is it about this that's troubling to me? And often it reveals an area where I need to be worked on by him. Even beyond all that, there are times when I still have trouble with something about him. And yet I will say, I will follow you. I will love you. I will trust you nevertheless. Now, the reason I'm camping here for a minute is because this story sets up everything you're going to read in Matthew 12 and 13. I'm telling you that now because I'm actually going to skip Matthew 12 and 13. We're going to be in chapter 14 next week, but I'm telling you that now that basically this is the theme in Matthew 11, 12, and 13 because Jesus is going to say some things that are going to cause some people to stumble. They're going to be hard to swallow. Let them work on you. You and I are following him. He's not following us. He's not called to be shaped into our image. We're called to be shaped into his. Now, we don't know what John the Baptist did when the disciples returned and gave him the message. But the gospel writer Mark says that he continued to live as a holy and righteous man in prison. And he would die there. I wish John could have heard what Jesus said about him after John's disciples left to take the message. Back to John. Look at this in verse 7. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? Why is Jesus saying this? He's wants to, he wants to take care of some business with them because a lot of them were offended by John. They were like, he's a wild man. He smells bad. He lives in the wilderness. You know, he tells us rough stuff. And Jesus said, hey, what did you expect to go out and see? He's a prophet. Do you think he was just going to be a wind, a reed swaying in the winds of your popular opinion? You think he's going to be in fine clothes? He's not a king, he's a prophet. Then what did you go out to see, Jesus says. He's talking about their expectations. A prophet, yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. He's about to compliment John. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Stop right here, you have your trivia question. Which human being did Jesus think was the greatest human being who ever walked the face of the earth? John the Baptist. If you're talking about somebody born of a woman, no one's greater than John the Baptist. This is what Jesus says. He's got respect for him. 
He's given him his props. But then watch what he says. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I'll explain that in just a second. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence. And violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and laws prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. He says some incredible things about John here. You know. He says, let me tell you what, what do you expect to go out and see? He's not going to be a reed just blown around by the winds of popular opinion, you know. He's not going to be in some fine clothes. And even more than that, I happen to think he's the greatest person ever born of a woman. That's how Jesus felt about him. That's the respect he had for him. And then Jesus flips it and he says, but I'm tell you what, if you're least in the kingdom of heaven, you're greater than him. In other words, he's saying, as great as I think John the Baptist is, are you paying attention to the kingdom of heaven that's present in me? Are you responding to me? And Jesus then talks about the kingdom of heaven suffering, being subjected to violence and violent people raiding it. What's he talking there? He just wants them to know, hey, listen, what's happening to John is nothing new. People have always resisted the moves of God with violence. He's setting them up for the cross. Because it's not the cross, the ultimate expression of violent resistance to the kingdom. And then he pronounces a title on John. It'd be the most significant title of all. He says, hey, he's the Elijah in the prophets. The prophets prophesied about another Elijah coming. He's the one. That's a big title he just gave him. Wow, what a compliment. But if he's the Elijah, then that makes Jesus the one. And then he goes back to this theme of expectations. Oh, man. Verse 16. To what can I compare this generation? Jesus is going to make a comment now about the crowds. They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. What in the world is Jesus talking about here? He's stacking these phrases. What's he saying? Let me break it down for you. He's saying, this generation's like a group of children expecting the adults to take cues from them. When the kids play the pipe, they want you to dance. When they sing the sad song, they want you to cry. But John and I don't take our cues from you. We're not dancing. When you want us to dance, we're not crying when you want us to cry. We're not marching to your drum beat and we're not singing along with your tune. The message of the king and the call of the king can be challenging. So challenging you can make up your reasons not to embrace it. John shows up not eating and drinking. And they say, he's got a demon. He's out there living in the wilderness. He never eats or drinks. He never enjoys himself. He's got a demon. The son of man shows up eating and drinking, doing the exact opposite. Ah, he's a drunkard and a glutton. Eats with tax collectors and prostitutes. In other words, it's John that needs to make some adjustments before we listen to him. It's Jesus that needs to make some adjustments before we listen to him. It's the message that needs work, not us. Somebody can always find a reason not to listen and to respond to the kingdom and the call of the king. Jesus says, John didn't march to your drum, and I'm not dancing either. And then Jesus flips the switch. It gets worse. Now he wants to talk about how they're responding to him. And the tune he's playing, verse 20. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. And so you go on to read about this comment where Jesus says, listen, it's going to be more bearable for Sodom. And everybody knew that story. No. It's going to be more bearable for Sodom than it's going to be for 
these towns, and one of the towns he names is Capernaum. That's his hometown. I can't imagine how hard it was for Jesus to say this because he knows all the people in these little villages. Jesus had given them incredible displays of his authority. Authority over sickness, the demonic. He raised the dead. He did some phenomenal things, and yet they still did not embrace him. And I can't imagine this was easy for Jesus to say. Here's a question. What do you think was the kind of repentance that Jesus is looking for? I don't think it was just believing in him. I think it had to do with adjusting their course in light of his message. You say, well, what's the message he preached? I think it's the message in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. You say, hey, we skipped that. Yeah, we're going to do that after Easter. But just let me give you a, a rough outline. Basically, he's saying, hey, my kingdom is not about overthrowing Rome, but it's about becoming the kind of person that hungers and thirsts for righteousness. It's about helping you to become merciful. It's about helping you to become a peacemaker. It's about you dealing with your anger, your lusts, your relationships, your need to forgive, how you treat your enemies, your pride, your greed, your anxiety, your fear, your judgmentalism. Guess what? I just did the outline of Matthew 5 through 7. Jesus is like, you're playing the flute of songs about revolutions involving overthrowing the Roman Empire and me kicking some Roman tail and making Israel great again, and I'm not dancing to it. I'm out to bring forth a different kind of greatness. I'm out to bring forth the kind of people that you were created to be all along. And I know I'm saying things that may be offensive to you. I know parts of my message can be hard, but everything I'm calling you to is truly best for you and to the glory of God through you. Will you let me save you? Will you listen to me? And through my grace and my power, pursue this kind of life because I'm trying to save you, not just for eternity beyond the grave. I'm trying to save you so you can have a life before the grave, so you can live while you're alive. That's what my name means, the Lord saves. Will you let me save you? And then this brings us to the last few verses of this chapter, jumping down to verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is what Jesus is driving at. He says, this is still, hey, I know I say stuff that troubles you. I know it's challenging, but at the heart of it all, I'm inviting you to come and find a rest for your soul. It doesn't sound like rest at first because he says, take my yoke upon you. I'm like, oh, just a, he says, come to me and I'll give you rest. I'm like, yes. And he says, take my yoke upon you. And I'm like, oh my goodness. That doesn't sound like rest to me. You say, what's a yoke? It's just part of an egg. I like it running, not really. A yoke is something that's, it, it, it was used to harness an oxen or an animal as it was plowing a field. But there were two kinds of yokes in Jesus' day. There's a single yoke and there's a double yoke. Often a younger animal was yoked to an older animal to learn what to do out in the field. Given the context of Jesus' teaching and who he is, I can't help but think he has a double yoke in mind. Jesus is at the farmer cracking the whip because he's humble and gentle, he's the one beside you. It's his yoke, and he's beside you. And you're learning how to live life with him as your rabbi. You're yoked with him. By the way, a yoke was a picture of a rabbi's teaching for that day. You join yourself with a particular rabbi, and your life with his teachings. Everybody had a rabbi they followed. Everybody had a yoke they were under. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. You'll find rest for your souls. Rest is what you'll find through yoking yourself with Jesus and all that he said. What does he mean by my yoke is easy? This is so important. That word there is crestos. It means my yoke is well-fitting. It fits you well. In other words, it's custom made for you. Check this out. It may chafe, it may scratch, it may be offensive to your flesh at first. It can take some getting used to, but you find in the end, it's the kind of life you were created to live all along. 
If anything, Jesus came to restore you to what it looks like to be a human being. And you find that even though it chafes and it's sore and it, and it takes some getting used to, in the long run, you find that it fits you well because it was custom made for you to live this way all along. I know some people who think it is a burden to go the way of the Jesus. But you know what he says? He says, my burden is light. How? Stop. Let's just think. Those of you who've lived a little life. Let's just think about that. Everybody is always living under a yoke. Everybody is always living under a prevailing story they tell themselves, a prevailing mental map for the way they ought to operate in life and what they want to do. Every human being is living with a philosophy of life. The issue isn't whether or not you have a yoke. The issue is, is under whose yoke are you? Think about how some other yokes have worked in your life. He says, my yoke is light. Why is it light? It's light compared to all the other yokes. If you think Jesus' call to purity is a heavy weight to bear, try living with immorality on your conscience. Try living with little pieces of your heart everywhere and having all kinds of attachments floating around with people out there. You know what science is now revealing in the last 30 years? about particular chemicals being released in your body when you have sex with somebody that basically puts your attachment system online to where it's always more than your body that's just involved, but there are expectations, attachments that arise chemically, neurologically in your mind. Jesus in scripture had something to say about the power of sex and it being about more than just the body. Some people go, I don't like that yoke. I'm going to live by this yoke over here that we've divorced it from everything. And it's just a utilitarian purpose for pleasure. And yet they can't figure out why they have so many feelings of attachment all over their life. If you think Jesus' call to love and forgive is heavy, try living in a state of bitterness and resentment. If you think Jesus' call to generosity is too demanding, see how trying to keep a grip on every dollar and every position you have works for you. And if it's ever enough, every now and then, you just got to ask yourself the question, how is this working for me? Yeah, his yoke, yeah, it hurts some and it's sore. It takes some getting used to, but it's light compared to all the others I've tried to live under. And I've lived long enough to know that the longer and deeper and more thoroughly I take up the yoke of Jesus compared to all the other yokes I've been under, the lighter it seems because I was made to live that way in the first place. You and I may trip over Jesus. You and I may stumble. You may find some things hard to swallow, but I'm going to tell you, keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Don't give up. And don't give in. Don't give up and don't give in. You just keep moving forward. He won't give in on what he's calling us to, but he won't give up on us either. He's gracious and he's patient. And he sends John's disciples back to him a hundred miles. He won't give in on his call but he won't give up on you and me. I know it because he gave his life for you and me. You tell me someone else who has. I found myself thinking about Colin Johnson this past week. Colin was a brother in Christ, lived here in Dallas, worked at Christian Works for Children, organization our church supported for many, many years. Colin was meeting with our staff, this was several years ago, giving us some updates on what's happening with children in Dallas and what we were involved in. It was great to see him. He was a precious brother in the Lord. And it wasn't two weeks after he was with us, he got the surprising news that he had cancer. He was dead within three months. Stunning to be with somebody 
in your family life center, so vibrant, telling you about the work that you're involved, so full of life, and the whole time there's cancer growing inside of him. And Colin wasn't offended. It might have taken a while to adjust as it would any of us when things happen that we don't expect. And there's nothing really wrong with being offended for a bit. It's just that you don't have to stay there. As his family was gathered around him and hospice was tending to him, on the last day of his life, they were privileged to have him conscious in the room. Not everybody is. One of his sons, who was an adult, said to Colin, Oh, Dad. Of all the things, thank you for introducing me to a real relationship with Jesus. And Colin didn't open his eyes, but raised one corner of his mouth and said, Oh, son. Jesus is all there is. He's all there is. Mm. And he really is all there is. Everything that is good and rich and abundant in life and every piece of wisdom that's found for surviving and processing the darkest things imaginable that have ever happened to you are found in Jesus. Don't give up. Don't give in. Let someone in on what it is you're tripping over in regard to Jesus. Process it with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Lift it up to the Father because he's not giving up on you. I leave you with three questions on the screen as we take communion together. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Mm. We praise you that you are not like us, Jesus, in one sense. <laughs> For we find that anything that clutters our life and makes things more difficult is, is in many respects, a lot of it is self-inflicted in our own life. And then in your entire call to follow you and addressing all the things you do, uh, Lord, is your desire to set us free, is your desire for our own good, is your desire for the Father's glory. And so we intend to follow you, even though we might be stumbling forward. <laughs> we intend to follow you. Mindful that every time we stumble, turns out in your power, in the end redeemed to be a stepping stone into glory for all of us. We eat and we drink to these things 